on time. All right, so it's recording. And uh, I asked you last week to view the chapters as well as to identify five points from each chapter that stood out for you. So we want to begin that exercise. We want to begin with that exercise where you will talk about your, each person will get a few minutes to speak about the five points that stood out for them. And then um, we would get into the lecture. After the first lecture, we're going to have um, a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the test. The first test is going to be next week, the multiple choice test. And we'll talk about what format the test will take and how we're going to execute the test, right? Um, what else? Yeah, and then we'll do chapter six. Okay, so let's start with our homework exercise from lectures three and four, where you had to identify five points from each lecture um, that stood out for you. Each person will have about five minutes. So you're not going to, you're not going to any great depth, you're just seeing what the five points are that stood out for you. And yeah. Okay, so let's start. Roshani, you want to start, please? And you have to put on your camera for this. Put on your camera, organize yourself so we can see you and you speak into the class. You're not yes, driving, sir. right? You're not driving, right? No, not driving. So I'll be able to respond. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, go so ahead. we'll um four points. The first one is educational psychology, where it looks at social, moral, and emotional development. And that deals with children. They still deal with children interactions while the moral deals with what, what the, the child think is wrong or wrong. Likewise, the emotional deals with their feelings. Good. Then they went to look personal and moral development. And the Erickson um, focused on this ask here, where he looked at the point at different ages then from board to the older to adults. Okay. Um, you want me to go into depth explaining that too? No, 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 no depth, no in depth. Just give you five points for each year. The other one with the stages of oral reasoning, where the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, the three different stages. That's when they started to obey rules to prevent for our punishment for punishment then we conventional we understand the rules <laughs> and the uh, conventional is where they go beyond expectation the right. other one is the fact of culture in teaching and learning where they look at the community the school and fam where each for each one each aspect they so those are my four five points thank you okay. thank you thank you very much sandia go ahead start to be honest i did not go through the lecture I did not have the time to do so. I'm going through. I'm going through it now. So probably after I'm <laughs> going to say something, I, I'm going to I'm going to contribute right. to the no. forum. No, you you're going to have an exam next week, huh? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Robin Ann? Robin Ann? you there? I will come back to Robin just now, Gavin.
No. No, sorry. I'm using my phone and the apps keep coming up in front. Yeah, um, yeah, the video, uh, what I remember was the theories. So there is the moral, real moral development by um, Lawrence, what was it, Kohlberg? Kohlberg yeah, that's, right? that's correct, Kohlberg, yeah. Yeah, so he had this theory where they have uh, three, three different stages. So he had um, pre-conventional level, which is a young child. Um, conventional level, which is like ad adolescent, adult. And then you have post-conventional, which is, I guess, like a senior person. So it basically talks about the ability to judge right and wrong, basically morals. And it at different at these different stages, they see it at um, different ways. All right, so example, like a, a child would do things to, like a young infant would do things to avoid punishment, right? So they would react totally different from how an adult or older person that would, they, who would more understand rules and laws and stuff like that, right? Then there was um, Piaget. Well, that was from the previous, I think it was going back the previous week, right? So that wasn't yeah. really the main focus. But then there was um, Eric. Erickson stages of psychosocial development, and he had, he had, he believes in eight stages, right? And what I remember is that they say people, other, I guess other um, researchers don't always, don't really believe in everything that he says. They kind of contradict what he say, like with infancy, he has, he has, trust and mistrust and they have autonomy and they have a stage when they're shame and they have that is like the second stage so that's what I remember and um, I remember the social the effect of social economic SES. on a child education, so education. Mm -hmm. yes so those are the things that I okay all right, so I give the exercise um, so that to ensure that you follow the, the follow the lecture because I know something if you don't give an activity to do, people might just brush it off, right? And also to help you to con try to begin to consolidate some of the information because a lot of information that will be coming at you, a lot of concepts, a lot of theories and so on, and next week you're going to be assessed on it. So I wanted people to make sure and go through and make their own notes and whatever their key points because the first exam, each of the exam, two exams we have in, would be based on the key points, the key terms from each chapter, all right, um, from a textbook. Okay, so we'll talk about that at the break when we, after the first lecture, we'll talk about that, all right? Um, Robin, are you there? Are you ready to speak about your points that you got from the lecture? So thanks, Gavin. Welcome. Yeah. I don't know the end from Robin, so I don't know what's going on. Okay, so let me um put up the first lecture and uh, share my screen. Okay, so am I sharing my screen? No, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Gavin, you're not seeing it yet? I'm seeing it now. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so today we want to look at chapter five, which deals with um, behavioral and social theories of learning. Um, so we'll get right into it.
Right. Right. So we some organizing questions for this lecture would deal with what is learning? What are behavioral theories? What are some principles of behavioral learning? And how has social learning theory um, contributed to our understanding of what human learning is all about? Right. So we, we're looking at the fundamental theories of learning in education. Um, when we talk about what learning is, we know that children are excellent learners. As a matter of fact, we look at young children as sponges. They come into the world, um, according to theorists, um, Rene Descartes, as clean slates, you know, and they are clean slates to be written upon and they take in everything from the environment. Even in that last trimester of pregnancy, you know, the developing um, fetus, the unborn fetus, is hearing, is, is experiencing a lot of sensations from what the mother is experiencing, whatever she feels. So they begin to learn even in the womb, right? The body mother music here, she likes to listen to the, um, the interactions that are taking place. If the father is coming home and communicating with the mother, touching the belly, communicating and so on. So they begin to learn even in the womb. Um, Sometimes children would learn things that are not intended for them to learn. So one has to be very careful of that because whatever they're exposed to over time is what they will focus on and what they would learn. So how do we define learning? So we define learning is usually as uh, uh, any change in behavior as a result of some experience or the other. Not what you are immediately born with, not what is in it. But we think we, we identify learning as what someone, a change that a person experiences, whether it's behavioral or cognitive or emotional or social change that they experience, as a, that, they, that they go through um, as a result of some experience. So generally speaking, behavioral theories focus on things that are pleasurable or things that are, are unpleasant consequences of behavior. What we talk about rewards that you may have learned in a uh, course or two before, we we'll talk about rewards and punishments, um, which are consequences of behavior that help people to learn over time. Whereas social learning theories focus on the effects of thought on action and action on thought. So you're talking about how individuals interact and learn from one another and um, what they observe and how they learn accordingly. So in terms of behaviorist theories, we want to talk about Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning, in which what we will consider to be a neutral stimuli will acquire the, the, um, the capacity to evoke responses when it becomes associated with an unconditioned stimuli that triggers certain reflexes. So when we speak about classical conditioning, we're really talking about um, behaviors that are conditioned through by through certain stimuli becoming conditioned stimuli and triggering reflex actions. So classical conditioning doesn't really deal with um, actions that one would actually think about and plan or execute, but classical conditioning deals with actions that we'll consider to be reflexive that you don't have full control over, but because you're conditioned to respond in a particular way, that is how you respond. respond. And um, in terms of behaviorism, we have B.F. Skinner is another theorist who continues to study the, the, the relationship between behavior and condition and, and its consequences. And he developed the theory called operant conditioning. So classical conditioning and operant conditioning are basically your two theories of behaviorism or two main behavioral theories. And in operant conditioning, we are looking at how reinforcers or punishers, rewards or punishments are used to shape the behavior that you want. As teachers, you all would know that in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis, you use rewards or punishments directly or indirectly to get students to, to do what you want them to do in terms of you want them to behave in acceptable ways, you want them to perform at an acceptable level, 
and there's some sort of a reward associated with performing at an acceptable level. And then you want to eliminate certain behaviors that are inappropriate or unacceptable. And so you would issue some sort of a um, punishment of one type or the other so that students, so that those behaviors would be reduced or eliminated. Okay, so let's talk about classical conditioning. So before I go into the, the details of classical conditioning, let me ask the question. Um, what do you know about classical conditioning? Have you ever heard the term before? Have you um, encountered it on another course? What, what do you know about classical conditioning? By Ivan Pavlov, the Russian physiologist. Anybody knows anything? Well, I think what I remember is um is is the stimuli and it's like um like you ring you ring a bell, mm -hmm. the children will go inside, like something like that. Like there's the stimuli, which is the bell, and the children go inside, which is the response. I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> um not really, but you have the idea of the bell and somebody responding to a bell. You know, there's something. Relates to Bell. All right. Anybody else? Roshani, Sandia, Robin, and you all heard of this theory before? Um, I, I did it once in another course, and I think mm -hmm. I remember. Um, what do you remember? Is this an experiment that was done with dogs? Yes, you're correct. Yes, yes. So um, so what I, I think it it is associated with it, um naturally occurring stimulus and um neutral stimulus mm -hmm. so i think um sir gavin got got the idea because um i the, this would be this would be unconditioned stimulus and it's where not is where stimulus that naturally and automatically triggers a response without prior learning so i think that's the concept of the bill okay all right all right good getting we're getting warm um roshani what is your response Sorry, I say like when the bell rings, the children, let me put it in the children prospect, right? They would know that, okay, if it's lunchtime, break time or whatever. So they, uh -huh. they react to that? Mm, well, not really. Because classical conditioning deals with reflexive actions or reflexes rather than actions that are deliberate. Um, that, and if you... If you respond to a bell because it's time to go inside because you know the time is school has school, that's um that's more operant type conditioning rather than classical conditioning. But you see what I mean as I go along. All right. So how did this whole notion unfold? This whole idea of um classical conditioning. So Pavlov was a Russian physiologist who was doing experiments on levels of saliva that dogs produce. He wanted to measure the levels of saliva that dogs produce when they respond to food that is presented to them, the meat that is presented to them. So that is why the meat in this case, as you can see in the, in the picture, oh, I'm trying to use multiple um, things here. As you can see here, the meat here is an unconditioned stimulus. And it's unconditioned because there is no conditioning, no conditioning has taken place. So a meat, so when you present dogs with meat, um they would naturally salivate. I don't know if you have had the experience of, and in Trinidad, I know we make mango chow. I don't know if you all do that in um, Guyana, where you use green mangoes and you cut it up and you put shadow benny and different seasoning and salt and pepper and so on in it, and you eat it like that. Do you all do that in Guyana? Yes, sir. That's pickle here. Sorry? That's what? Pickle. We call it mango. Pickle. 
<laughs> right, mango pickle, right? Or we call it mango chow, right? And but for me, but, but I don't know if you experienced when you pickle when you, mango, sir. Huh? It's pickle mango, sorry. Pickle mango, not mango pickle. All right. When you when you making your mango pickle, I don't know if you ever experienced that your mouth begin to water because of the sourness and the mango and the expectation and the taste and the pepper and the salt and whatnot. I don't know if you all have ex experienced that. Yes or no? I guess when you're smaller. Right, when you're smaller, right? You got your mouth begin to water. And that is a, it's an unconditioned response because you don't choose to tell your saliva. You don't tell your saliva, okay, what begin to flow. But just the smell and just the anticipated taste can cause your salivary glands to be activated and your mouth to water. And if it may not ha happen with um, the mango, pickle mango, it might happen, mango pickle, it might happen with something else that is sour, that has a sour taste. From the time you approach it or you go to eat it or you go to buy it, you get that sensation in your mouth. So um, in that case, whatever it is, would be the unconditioned stimulus because it's stimulating something. And the salivation is the unconditioned response. So that is what was happening um, when before conditioning, as you can see on the screen, before conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus stimulated an unconditioned response, which is salivation. And when if Pavlov rang a bell, the dog would not respond. There's no response to the bell because a bell does not automatically cause the dog to salivate. However, he began to realize that um, when the when the, the workers, the lab assistants, were coming to the dogs and the dogs began to hear their footsteps coming to bring the meat or the meat powder, they began to salivate, the dogs began to salivate at the sound of the feet, at the sound of the footsteps of the lab assistants. So he said, wait a minute, I'm onto something here. Like they're beginning to be conditioned. And he, what he started to do, he started to... Um, Ring the bell. He started to ring the bell here, as you can see. And he peered, and as soon as he rang the bell, he presented the meat powder, the meat. As soon as he rang the bell, he presented the meat. So the dog began to salivate immediately. So he rang the bell and he put the meat. He rang the bell and he put the meat. So what happened, so that he was conditioning them to respond to the bell um, in anticipation of the food that was going to come. So what eventually happened was that all he simply had to do was ring the bell and the dogs began to salivate. And in this case, the bell, the ringing of the bell became the condition stimulus. And the salivation of the dogs became the condition response. So, so that was the process of conditioning. Any questions? You all understand what took place there? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Right, Sandia, Robin. Right. Okay. So let's move on. Yes, sir. Right. So. So the process. So that is why we are saying that classical conditioning is not a process that deals with voluntary action because salivation is not a voluntary action. It is a involuntary action or a reflexive action. So conditioning really deals with re reflexive actions that are, auto that are automatic, more or less controlled by the para parasympathetic nervous system, right? So the unconditioned stimulus would be the meat powder in the first instance before conditioning. The meat is the unconditioned stimulus. And the response 
to the dog of the dog to by salivating when they when they see the meat presented before them. That's the unconditioned response. Before conditioning, the bell is the neutral stimulus, and it, because it's neutral because it does not elicit any response at all. However, during conditioning, both are paired. The bell is paired with the unconditioned stimulus. As soon as the bell is rung, the food is presented. And so, and the dog gives an unconditioned response. And that's be during conditioning. And after the dog has been conditioned, you will see that when, as soon as the bell is rung, no food has to be presented, the dog begins to salivate because the two, these two, and the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are so close together that the one is um, the expectation of the food is immediate. And so you get um, conditioned. That is how conditioning takes place. So the dog doesn't have to, you don't have to present food for the dog to salivate. You just present the conditions, you just ring the bell and salivation takes place. Okay. So sorry, did he do this with humans? Because there's an the animal test. Right. <laughs> yes. He did it with he did it with um with dogs mainly, and then he realized. It can be transferred. The be same similar behaviors, reflexive actions can be transferred if you conditioned, if you condition um individuals to behave in a certain way. So for example, if you are in a building and you hear a uh, in the building an alarm goes off and you look and you see red flashing lights outside of the room inside of the building, but in another room, but you hear a siren going off and you the a lights are flashing what will ha what do you think is going to happen how would you feel yeah go ahead gavin well what I, at, our, at school mm -hmm. we train the children when they hear a bell ring constantly yeah. right away they know it's an emergency and they they would start to say sorry is there an emergency and they would start heading to the door they're right. automatically conditioned. Yes. But I, I'm speaking about you as a, an adult. If you're in a, right, in a get building, you, you never went in that building before. It's the first time you're in the building. And while you're there, you hear a siren goes off in the building. And yeah. Oh, what is your response? You get nervous. Nervous, you get nervous and nervous. anxious. Right. So is nervousness a choice or is it a, a reflexive action? I guess it's reflective. Um, reflexive. A reflexive action. So we are more or less conditioned to respond to the sound of an alarm by fear or first initial or first response is fear because we have been conditioned. You see a red flashing light, you hear a siren going off, an alarm going off, there's danger. Something is wrong. You need to, to, to get out of that space or get out of that place immediately. So we so that's that's classical conditioning. Because you have been conditioned to behave and to believe that that represents um, danger. Now, the danger could be a fire, the danger could be an earthquake, the danger could be and it could be any kind of danger. So that that is so those would those um incidents or those activities or those if that occurs those occurrences those occurrences would be the unconditioned stimulus. And the conditioned stimulus would be the alarm because the alarm has no inherent danger in it. Right or wrong? The alarm itself doesn't present a danger. Correct. Right. But is the is, is what the alarm represents, what follows, what what the triggers the alarm is what would um cause the, the, the is what where the danger lies. So we have been conditioned to respond that way. Okay, now, so for example, if you have, a, 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 let's bring it to education now. If you have a teacher in a school, or something you go to a school and there are teachers who the children gravitate towards and there are teachers who the children will try to avoid. And so you have the first day of class, the teacher, um, for any slightest thing, the, the, the teacher shouts at the children. She doesn't communicate with them. There is no um, changing of tone or voice, and she gradually 
becomes angry, she just flies off the handle and shouts at them. And as young children, they become fearful. What will event what eventually happens if, if that consistently happens over a period of time? You might find that children from the time they begin to they begin to enter the classroom before they begin to interact with the teacher for the day, they begin to be fearful. And the teacher hasn't said anything. So the classroom itself, the, that place, the classroom, becomes the condition stimulus because it is closely associated with the fear that they would, the, the, with the anger that is expressed by the teacher and the fear that is associated with the, the, um, with the, the space or with that place. And it can happen in positive ways as well. So if the teacher is warm and caring and endearing, then they feel they have a positive emotional response naturally. And so entering into that space will have, they have a pleasant overall feeling. It's not, it's not a feeling or so that they choose, but it's one that is reflexive of, is a reflexive response based on the condition that has happened in that space over a period of time. Does anyone understand what I'm saying? Do you have you seen that in as teachers, Sandia? Yes, sir, I understand what you're saying, but from what I've experienced, when you're when you when you make the children to come to my classroom, you seem to take advantage of it. Sorry, and when they, they do get, what? Huh? They take advantage. They take advantage of that, you know, free space or comfortable space that you usually give them, mm -hmm. and the first thing. The, well, the first thing I was told before entering the classroom is be strict and sturdy, so they know their so they they know their place. So when they see you, they must become fearful. <laughs> <laughs> so they must be afraid of you. Yes, because but they, sir, they, they don't they... always work. It um, I think it get it negative and and it's positive because, for example, there are some children at who when they hear that they are coming into teacher Robin and class, they are scared. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they get a second, they don't want to come, but then when they, they get into come. my classroom and they get to know who is rubbing on, they don't want to leave. So you sometimes, see? even though you might be stern, even though you might be stern or something, you got to be harsh, there is some part of you that you have to show them the other side. Don't always be this, 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 uh, what's this calling? exactly. Don't, don't always be like that. There are times that you could just show them just by giving them a, a smile here and there or yes. hug them something. Mm -hmm. And they will understand that there's a no miss miss was upset because of X or Y. Yes. That's how she responded that way. But yes. that is not her. Right. So um so those are things as 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 teachers that I think sometimes we as teachers, we tend to be too tough or you know, mm -hmm. we don't allow the children to see the human side of us. That we just care and just love and we, we because we can be both. We right. can be because a stuffy we, go, we, go we don't want them to take, take advantage. But even if, it, but then um, there's always a limit to everything. I was afraid of, I was yeah, afraid okay. of Miss Robin and Forrest too. And I'm so far away. But then I got <laughs> to know her and then she, she turned out to be, <laughs> to be quite a pleasant um, person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I think the way in which I would talk, the thing about it is that I think my, my father is from St. Lucia. So I yeah. don't have this kind of soft kind of voice. Yes. It's more like coarse and, Tough, you know, yeah. and, not, and not female like. Yes. So I think listening to my voice, you would think to that, has she got a song so far? But honestly, I'm, and another thing, people tend to say that I'm upset, which I, I'm, I'm not. They don't know when I'm upset from when I'm not upset because that is my normal tone. <laughs> So just imagine if adults get in a problem. What about, about children? Children, wow, yes, yes. Exactly. But you understand yeah. what I'm saying? I'm saying that yeah. saying that if you if one thing is when you when we're talking about classical conditioning, every time the bell was rung, the meat was presented. You understand what I'm saying? So that there was an immediate association between the two. So it's not like, okay, well, they come into your class and you're, you're firm with them and you're strict with them, but then over time, you know, you kind of balance it off. Sometimes they see a different side of you and so on. So in classical conditioning, there is no 
room for that balance. Is one thing represents something else all the time. Because if, if there is a change, if sometimes when, if the bell is wrong sometimes and no meat is presented, if that happens over a period of time, then the dogs will, the behavior, the salivation would stop. And that is called extinction. The behavior becomes extinct because the the um the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus is eliminated. There is no reason for the dogs to salivate anymore because there is no food, no meat is presented, only the ringing of the bell. So the two must consistently go together for the automatic reflex response. From the time you eliminate the condition, the unconditioned stimulus, the meat powder, from the time it is eliminated and you only present the um <clears throat> the condition stimulus the behavior becomes extinct so for example if if miss robin Ann say um i'm going to keep you all, all of you all in lunch time because y'all were talking and behaving naughty this morning and everybody gets scared when she but every time she says that and she does it sometimes but every time she says it now she doesn't keep anybody in you would see that there's no, eventually there'll be no fear response when she says that because they know that the consequences of being, of staying in will not follow as threatened. So the behavior, the expected behavior will become extinct. They would not, you wouldn't get an automatic fear response when she raises her voice and when she reprimands. Right? Any questions? Any other additional questions? What you just say there remind me um that the a teacher told me when I started teaching a teacher told me mm -hmm. don't ever threaten a child and don't follow don't through, follow through. don't yeah. commit a punishment the children will read you and recognize okay you're only bluffing you always bluffing <laughs> yeah <laughs> my own child will not for me um I was I keep telling him if he keeps screaming I'm gonna I'm gonna put some lashes on him so then his little brother started screaming. <laughs> And um, I told his brother, I'm going to, I'm going to put some lashes on you. And the elder one was like, no, she will not. She only says <laughs> that. Yeah. So don't worry about that. She's she just saying that she's not going to do it. She's not going to follow through. Right. So the, so the thing to remember about classical conditioning is that it deals with re reflexive actions, reflexive emotional feelings, um, physiological responses that you do not have control over. Okay. And behaviors are conditioned to automatically flow from the conditioned stimulus. And, and after conditioning, as you can see on the screen, after conditioning, before conditioning, um, the unconditioned stimulus would be the, the meat or whatever is the main thing that presents that causes the unconditioned response. The, the neutral stimulus would be whatever it is that doesn't necessarily, because a, a classroom wouldn't necessarily cause students to feel fearful. Then when the condition stimulus, when the classroom now or um becomes associated with this teacher's particular teacher's rough voice, which would be the unconditioned stimulus, that creates an unconditioned response. So that's during conditioning. But after conditioning takes place, just being in the classroom itself can elicit a fair response. As Robin Ann was saying, some students here from the time they hear the good in Miss Robin Ann class, they start to get frightened because it is associated, they're associated with being roughly treated or being roughly dealt with. But when they get there, they realize she can be, a, 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 there's a human side to her as well, not just her raw voice. And she's not vexed all the time. <laughs> so the condition stimulus um, brings a conditioned response. Okay, right. Okay, let's move forward. Right, so Skinner operant conditioning is slightly different to classical conditioning. He proposed that reflexive behavior comes for only a small portion. He says reflexive behavior is only a small proportion of all behaviors, which is true. Most of our behaviors are really um deliberate and behaviors that we choose to, to choose to do. So 
he focused on another class of behavior called, he labeled them as operants. And operants really represent anything that we do where we more or less, we operate on the environment. So if I pick up my, if I pick up my cell phone like this, that is an operant. The action of picking up my cell phone is an operant action, operant behavior. I'm operating on an aspect of my environment. If I see some food or I see some fruits, I pick it up and I start to eat, that's operant condition. So he says the reflexive actions and the um, immediate responses that you don't have control, that is only a small portion of the behaviors. The majority of the behaviors that we do are operant behaviors where we are operating on our environment. So his work focused on the relationship between behavior and its consequences. Um, and, they have, and this is where he says, the use of unpleasant or unpleasant consequences to change behavior is referred to as operant conditioning. So based on the consequences that follow the behavior, whereas classical conditioning, the stimulant came first, whatever, stimu whatever stimulated the, the response came first. In operant conditioning, we are looking at the expectation of pleasant or unpleasant consequences that determine the behaviors that you choose. So in operant conditioning, the consequences that follow behavior is what would determine whether you choose to do the behavior or not choose the behavior. You'll see a little better what I mean shortly. So he did his development in his famous, what is called the Skinner Box. Um, it's a device that contains simple apparatus for studying animal behavior, animal behaviors, usually rats and pigeons. And what you're seeing here in this um, picture, this Skinner Box here, you're seeing something, there's a speaker, there's a, a lights, a, green, a red light and a green light, and a lever to press and um, a dispenser, a pellet dispenser. So these rats and the animals that he worked with would usually be kept to um, at least about a third of their body weight. They would not have about a third of their body weight. So they kind of basically hungry. So they had to do the different actions to be fed. And what he would do, so like when the red, when the green light came on and the rat observed it and the rat pressed the lever, something by accident at first, press the lever, they will get a pellet. When the red light comes on and they press the lever, they would not get a pellet. So if eventually the, the rat begin to realize, wait a minute, once the, the green light is on and the lever is pressed, I will get a reward. And the reward, the reward is the pellet. So you'll find that the 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 the, the rat would um would be anxiously awaiting for the, and excitedly awaiting for the green light to come on, green light to show, to flash, in order to press the lever and get the pellet. And this is where the, the, um, the operant conditioning, where it will be conditioned. And when the, you'll you find when the red light is on, it will not want to press the pellet because it may not get any reward or when the red light is on and press the lever it might get a small electric shock so whenever the red light is on you'll find that the rat will avoid pressing the pellet because they know that the consequence of pressing the pellet when the red light is on is punishment is an, an aversive or negative response negative consequence rather right so operant conditioning was how we learn. He said, this is how we learn behaviors by being rewarded or punished based on the behaviors that we do. And if the behavior is rewarded or it is or reinforced by some sort of a reward, the behavior is likely to be repeated. So there's specific language, reinforcers. So reinforcers increase the frequency of a behavior and punishes decrease the um, frequency of a behavior. So give me an example in your class from your own teaching, some reinforcers that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and some punishers that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Each person gave me one, one of each. Well, whenever I teach um P classes, mm -hmm. whenever if if they are because sometimes they are not very good students, but whenever they are good, I they usually take them outside to do practical work. But they we can't usually do corporal punishment anymore. So their punishment would be to stay in class and do theoretical works. Right. For PE. So, so, yes, if, sir. so if they behave good, they go outside and play games and whatnot and whatnot. And if they behave yes. in the morning before the PE class, they'll stay inside and do theory. Yes. Right. Okay. Anybody else? I do basically the same thing. Like you can stay, recess, mm -hmm. which is 15 minutes. If you don't complete your work in time, mm -hmm. you don't get to go to recess. You have to stay in and finish your work. So next day they would, well, let me push, try to finish my work finish so I can go. Right. Good. Yeah. Sorry, I'll do both that, Miss Ga uh, Sorry, Gavin and Miss um, Sandy. Mm -hmm. They love a pee, so. <laughs> Once it misbehave for a complete task, that's a no-no. Yes. Yeah, right. And I have some children, when it's 10 o'clock, oh, five, they have to get that pee, that blood, so it's that break. So it's telling her, mm -hmm. we're going to finish before. Right. Okay. Yes, Robin. So, all right for me, that's what I do. If, you, if I give you a homework and you ain't complete my homework, you have a work in lunch. Simple as that. You eat your lunch right in the class, you finish my homework before the lunch time up. Right. So is so it the person uh, complete their work will get lunch and you'll have to remain in, inside. Right. Now so you, you, use a, you use an interesting terms that teachers often use. Is it your homework or their homework? You say if you don't finish my homework. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, you really have to complete the work and want them complete. No lunch. <laughs> right. They will eat. But you know, but you know that's something that that's that's something that teachers do. That's something that teachers say that they shouldn't, because when whenever you say that, technically you take any responsibility away from them. Did you complete your homework? Because this is of value to you to reinforce what I would have taught you in the school. Because you remember you want to develop self-regulated learners, you want to develop independent learners, and you want them to develop a certain level of independence over time as they grow and as they mature. So you want to get that into their heads very early. Okay? So the language that teachers use should begin to change because you want to put that responsibility on the teachers. And Roshani said something that you have to be careful of. You have to be careful of associating work with school, work with punishment. So if you behave good, you get to go outside and play. If you behave bad, you'll stay inside and do work because I'm punishing you with work. So you have to be careful of the association that we make with certain um, work so that some students might grow up thinking, oh gosh, every time I just sit down and do work, oh God, I'm being punished, I'm being, you know, because um, I have to stay inside and do work. But they should get joy in doing the theoretical part, you want them to be, you want them to be, because who knows, some of them might be physiologists, some of them might be um, PE teachers themselves, some might be trainers and so on. And the theoretical part is just as important and just as valuable as the physical aspect. So even though they are children, you don't want, you, you have to be careful that you don't make a close association and they begin to stigmatize. Because I remember, that in school, when, when we did PE in secondary school, and you heard you're not going out to the side today, it's like, oh, gosh, I'll stay inside and take notes. It's like, oh, such a bummer, right? And it felt as if you were being punished, although the teacher didn't use those terms. So, yeah. Is that understood? I just want to share those two points with you all. Because teaching is about learning and developing your skills and developing your competencies and about growing in your craft and becoming more and more skillful in your craft and how you, yes, you don't, you can't use corporal punishment, but there are different ways and different strategies. You can read up and study and understand your children so that you can use different ways to take away things that are valuable to them so that they would um, 
be encouraged. Sorry, but I want to know what. Sorry, but I want to know what children look at as valuable. For example, mm -hmm. I can remember my son. I said to my son one time, "You're how not old? going on how school." How old? How old was he? I think he was a primary school at that time. But let me say between let me say eight or nine. All right. He good, wasn't yeah. going on a school tour, and he said to me, "Um, Robin, I ain't gotta go to tour now. I ain't got to tour some other time." So how could that be a punishment? Right. You okay, understand? So, yeah. He mm -hmm. already established the fact that if I ain't gonna know, I'll, I'll go, go next time. Time. <laughs> next time I'll go. <laughs> exactly. Right. So but how's perhaps, that a punishment? Right. So but, well, he was thinking for an eight or nine year old to think like that, it could be one or two things. He's a child that accustomed going out and going different places. So if he can get to go on that, you know, say what? Or he's thinking in a more, you have spoken to him about the value of uh, making sacrifices. And if he, you know, you can't, if you get something, you, you have to put up, put up some for later, leave some for next time or whatever. So he can delay gratification. So if he has to delay gratification, he's willing to do that. So I don't know what is in your, your individual situation. or what, But if he's thinking like that, it's because he has experienced before that, okay, yes, you get punishment, but it's not going to stay that way forever. You're going to get the benefit of it in the long term if you go through what you're going through now. Sir, it wasn't a case that it was a form of punishment. I wanted to punish him, but it turned no, out not to be a punishment. I am not saying that 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 is not what you wanted to do. I am saying I if, you get, sir, if, you, if you get into his thinking, you have, oh, to be able to assess, you have to be able to assess why he was thinking like that. Is it that he's more mature for his age? Because a child who is being denied getting to go out with his friends on a school trip should be vexed and should be angry. That's the normal response for a child. But if he's not thinking like that, probably he's a little more mature for his age, or he has already been taught that you can't get everything your own way. Sometimes things will not go your way, but it wouldn't stay that way forever. But, sir, I think he was too mature for his age because he was always forced, right? Because <laughs> his life... He was the only child for a long period of time? Huh? Was he an only child for a long period of time? Not really, but the, the, the child just... Be, to me, bent on his ways, man. To me, he was a, the, the male and, and, like, you being the female, no matter what you try to enforce, he used to find a way out. It's like, personally, I couldn't punish him. Whatever I try, he try to make it look as nothing at all. <laughs> you know? He's only to be a very clever. He's only to be very clever. Huh? Should probably reward instead of using punishment. Because sometimes punishment does give you a negative effect. Because I notice it a lot with children. Yes. The children yeah. nowadays, the children are born in 2000, they're different. They're different, yes. Yeah. So he sounds like he's very clever. I wonder if he got it, who he got the cleverness from. His mother or his father, or a little bit of both. Sir, I don't know. A little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Apples don't fall far from the tree, you know. So if if he's thinking like that, he could have got get that kind of thinking or those kind of thought processes from what he see, what he's seeing around him. Are his father or his mother? And you say, you gonna get on if you think you're gonna get on top of my back and control me, I will show you that you're not going to control me. He get that from somebody. Sir, I could have never controlled that young man. Never, never. Anybody no matter could, what I try. Could anybody I have controlled control you? Him. Let me ask you a question. Could anybody have controlled yeah. you? No, sir. Well, so what, so what <laughs> do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> but he's a child. He, he, things that I'm an adult, he's a child. Yes, but he would inherit certain ways of thinking and certain ways of behavior from what he ex what from genetic what we, as we discussed last week week before okay. from genetic inheritance as well as what okay, he's seen and what he's observing <laughs> okay sir and i accept <laughs> that part of it <laughs> you see it's, it's positive you see what we give with our children are both positive and negative you know and that is a good a good trait in a sense that he has that he's not going to be a follower and that he knows that he can turn around a negative situation and a positive one and have you confused when you think you get in and sometimes it's just a facade, and something it's just like, yeah, I know I'm getting punished, but I'll never let somebody know I'm being punished. I will tell them, no, nah, that ain't nothing, that's not affecting me. <laughs> so, but that's a level of mature thinking for an eight or nine year old. How old is he now? Sorry, he's 24 now. 
Right. And has he done well for himself? I think he's doing well in his eyes, but for me, no. He never wants <laughs> to go not my not way. satisfied. But he, he's a, you never know, like I keep telling him, he was like a horse, right, mango? You ever oh, see a, a mango that look right but taste sour? <laughs> that was my son. That and was... that's his, his my son. On yes, to know. Yes. He on his own path. All right, good. Okay, so we understand the we understand the difference between the two. So you have to you have to um in your classroom, make sure you follow through on your consequences, make sure that your consequences, the negative consequences or the punishments are match the the thing that the child would have done. So don't have the same type of punishment for every little thing. If they do something small, the punishment should match the activity, the, the, the infraction or the wrong that would have done. If they do something a little more serious and so on. Some people want to give the harshest punishment for the slightest thing. When you do something worse, what are you going to do? Kill them? You can't. So always have different measures in place for different types of um, wrongs that children may do. Also, you also want to give them an opportunity to self-correct. So if they do something wrong, you might give them a chance. Say two, two strikes or three strikes. If you do this again, um, then I would issue the punishment or... I give you a chance to say that you're sorry and to correct your behavior and I would not apply the punishment. So you often, because you remember you're also developing human beings, right? And every not every time somebody does something wrong, the punishment automatically follows, right? So you have to be able to um, work that into your system as well. Um, then there's the prima principle and some of you would have applied this. So some as some um, of you have said earlier, the prima principle, so complete all your work. Once you complete all your work, you'll get to go outside for pee. So you use a more favored activity to help to, to encourage them or to motivate them to complete a less favored activity. So if they like to play games or they like to have free time or like to go in, you have a um, corner for reading or something like that in your class, you can use that as a reward if behaviors if the behaviors or um, the completion of the less favored activities are up to standard, right? And that's called the PRIMA principle. It states a way to increase less enjoyed activities, linking them to more enjoyed activities. Once you finish this, you get to do that. The rule of consequences. Um, the most important principle um, of the behavior learning theory is that behavior changes according to its immediate consequences. Once the consequences are positive, the behavior is likely to change in a positive direction. Once the consequences are negative, the behaviors are likely to change in a negative direction. Um, it's supposed to weaken in most instances. And it's not 100% foolproof. Um, so that's why they say pleasurable consequences um, strengthen behavior and unpleasant consequences should weaken behavior. Um, so the, the, the frequency of a behavior is likely to be um, improved once the consequences are pleasurable. And if the consequences are unpleasant, then the behavior is supposed to be reduced. So if a child, um, so sometimes some teachers have a reward chart in their class and they put stickers next to names that have pleasant behaviors. Sometimes it works for a while and then it begins to fade. But the teacher has to be consistent with the behavior. So once a child looks up on the board and they wants to get that sticker by the name and they wants to have that positive um, reward, or if they finish their work, you put on, give them a sticker, good job, well done, excellent work. That's what they want to see. You'll find that they, they, the likelihood of those behaviors being repeated together um, is increased, right? So those are the rules of consequences. Then you have reinforcers. A reinforcer is any consequence that will strengthen a behavior. Um, the effectiveness of reinforcers must be demonstrated. So you can't assume that any reinforcer would strengthen a behavior. It has to be something that the person appreciates or the person values. So you have here some coins, you have um, movie tickets, you have sweets or snacks. Uh, so you can't assume that a reward is a reinforcer for everyone under all conditions, all right? 
So bear that in mind. So some children are motivated by some reinforcers and they may not be motivated by others. Um, they have intrinsic and extrinsic reinforcers. The intrinsic reinforcers, as it can be seen in the picture here, would be things like um, their own pride, their interest in their work, their achievement, they want to achieve, they're curious. That's intrinsic. So they are motivated from the end. They're rewarded from the inside based on satisfaction of these um, emotions or, or um, these aspects, right? Whereas external or extrinsic motivating factors, extrinsic reinforcers would be like punishment, grades, praise, money. Because all of these things are coming from the outside as consequences of the behavior. So, so some people just naturally like to draw, they like to read, they like to sing, they like to play games, like they hike, swim, for no other reason than just the fun of doing it. So reinforcers of this type are called intrinsic reinforcers. So there are some children who love spelling, they love to read, they love math. And you don't have to give them any reward for doing it. They just love doing it. And there are others, um, they look forward to get the praise or the reward or and that is what motivates them to engage in the behavior. So some are extrinsically motivated and some are intrinsically motivated. The earlier certain behaviors start is the greater the intrinsic reward. The later certain behaviors start would be more or less the extrinsic reward. But you have to be careful that um, when some children are naturally motivated or intrinsically motivated to do certain things, you don't give them a reward for doing it. Because if they are naturally motivated to do math and they love math just for the joy of doing it or science or reading or whatever, and they get a reward on top of that for doing it, if they get a reward to do it on a daily, on, a, on any kind of a basis, what will happen is if you the time you cannot get the reward, the behavior might begin to dip because the behavior has now become extrinsically rewarded rather than where it was intrinsically rewarded. So you have to be very careful when you reward children for doing things that they naturally like to do. Anyone has ever seen that happen? A child was real pumped up and real doing this and you don't have to give them anything to do it. And then they started to get reward and once the rewards started to drop off, the behavior started to change. And it could also happen in the other way around as well, where somebody could be extrinsically rewarded for something, and then after they get to like it so much, they don't need the extrinsic reward to do it. They just do it naturally on their own. Have any of you seen that in your teaching, in your teaching experience? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gavin, thanks. Right. Theory into practice, uses of reinforcement. Um, so you have to decide on what behaviors you want from students and reinforce these behaviors when they occur. Now, some teachers say, put up your hand if you have, if you um, if you have to an answer. When I ask a question, I only say put up your hand. But sometimes students put up their hand and they don't call them. And other students blurt out an answer and they take the answer. So what will eventually happen? The, the students will stop putting up their hand because they realize. I just put my hand on Ms. Louis, don't call me. So, so sometimes you have to be conscious and careful as a teacher that the behaviors that you want to reinforce, you make sure and you, re you reinforce those behaviors, the behaviors that you want to um, develop in the students. Tell, tell students what behaviors you want. When they exhibit those behaviors, you reinforce them and you tell them why. Reinforce appropriate behaviors as soon as possible after it occurs. So don't wait too long because remember you're talking about association between behavior and consequences. The closer the consequence is to the behavior, is the more likely the behavior is to be repeated or the behavior is to be diminished. Consequences that weaken behavior are called punishers, as we said. And note that there is the same catch in the definition of punishment as, as in the definition of reinforcement. If an, um, if an apparently unpleasant consequence does not reduce the behavior, the frequency of a behavior that follows it, it is not necessarily a punisher. 
So if what you're punishing the child with, as Robin Ann said, is not reducing the behavior, then, um, then the behavior is not a punisher. If it reduces the behavior, then it is considered to be a punisher, right? So you have to look at either the reduction of behavior or the increase in the behavior to decide whether it's a reinforcer or a punisher. Um, as I said, the, the, the contiguity or the immediacy of the consequences are important. Um, the behavioral learning theories emphasize that consequences that follow behavior closely in a time affect behavior more than those with delayed responses because they both associate with one another. Waiting to give a rat in a skin a box of food pellet for pressing a bar will significantly increase learning time for the con because of the connection between the bar pressing and the food. By the time the food arrives, the rat may be doing something other than pressing the bar. So as soon as it presses the bar, the food must come out because it will associate the pressing of the bar with the food. So the immediacy of the consequences are important. Reducing behavior, disruptive behavior with sit and watch. So this here, um, this chart here represents a behavior checklist. And this is the number of disruptions per 10 minute session. So you have a lot of disruption taking place. And the sit and watch class had an alternative education class had very few disruptions. So the baseline was between 60 and 80 disruptions. And then um, the fourth grade class, when they instituted the sit and watch. So if you if you disrupted the class, you had to sit apart from the class and watch and observe what was going on and without being able to participate. And as a result of that, the number of disruptions dropped after 35, 40, 45, after 50 days going on to the end of the term. So it worked both in the alternative education class and in the normal fourth grade class. The number right. Okay, so it's from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Okay, so it shows here that the sit and watch um, form of punishment reduced the disruptive behavior in both instances. Right. Shaping is another concept of operant conditioning. Shaping um, comes as a result of timely feedback and it, and it is very effective in teaching practice based on, the, on, a, on behavioral learning theory. And this is how shaping occurs. When you, give, when you guide students towards goal by reinforcing the many steps that lead them to success, you are shaping their behavior. So for example, if you are, if you are doing an activity with a child and there are six steps in the activity, this is how shaping works. Every time they complete an advanced step, they would get some sort of a reward or some sort of a um, reinforcement. Well done, okay, keep going and so on. If they can give them social encouragement, verbal encouragement and so on. But if they make a mistake and they have to start over, they will not get any reward until they pass the last step that they were at. So if they make a mistake at step number three, when they start over from step one, they're not going to get a re reinforcement on one. They're not going to get reinforcement on two. They will only get a reinforcement after they complete three. And so you continue until the, the only time they will get a reinforcement is when they complete the entire activity successfully, following all the steps. So you would have shaped the behavior by rewarding successive approximation of the behavior that you desire as it occurs. So something might do long division or long subtraction or long multiplication. And you can use the shaping um, strategy where you're reinforcing successive approximation of the behavior when they get the different advanced steps correct. When you are um, doing that, then you would give the, the, the reward. Yeah? Any questions? You all understand that concept, what shaping is? How you shape behavior through reinforcers with reinforcement? Yes, sir. Yes, Roshani. Oh, 
مش هنيه دي Yeah, I'm here. I'm listening, but I press something on the phone. I couldn't get you. Oh, okay. Unmute. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Right, Robin. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Extinction, as I as I said before, extinction is the weakening and the gradual disappearance of the behavior as reinforcement is withdrawn. So the behavior becomes extinct um, when no reinforcement occurs after the behavior is done. So children putting up their hands and, you, and you're not taking their hands or you're taking the hands of person who shout not or you're taking the response of person who just shout out the answer without putting up their hands. Eventually, they wouldn't put up their hand, they'll just shout out the answer because that is what is being re, um, rewarded. The cartoon here, please, mom, please. You let Tom do it. All other moms say it's okay. Please, can't I do it? Please, mom, please. And the mother is not budging. So, yeah. So because the mother is not given in, you find that the behavior will become extinct. Right? So that's, you have to understand that concept called extinction. You also have schedules of reinforcement. Um, I use, these are used to increase the probability of behavior of, of a behavior being repeated, and it is with probab probability, frequency, or persistence of a desired behavior. Reinforcement schedules may be either fixed or variable, and they may occur at ratios or intervals. So you can have schedules of reinforcement. So there's, there's a timing and the frequency of the reinforcement when you're going to reinforce. So you have a fixed schedule. So it is the and this one is the constant number of behaviors for required for the reinforcement. Um, steady response rate, the response patterns, you have a steady response rate, you have a pause after reinforcement. So if you say that, okay, if you, um, so a, a fixed ratio, you say, well, okay, every time you do two subjects, you'll get a, a five minute um, game break. Or five minute break to to chat with your friends. So what what will happen is you have a fixed schedule schedule of reinforcement. So they're looking forward to this five minute break after they complete two subjects, or it can be three subjects. So it's a fixed ratio. It come in every time, right? But what you'd find is that after the during extinction, there will be a rapid drop in response after the required number of responses passes without reinforcement. So if two, so if you do two subjects and you go on to a third one and didn't get any reinforcement after the two as was promised, then you'll find that um, the behavior will drop because it's not being reinforced. Then you have variable ratio, the variable number of behaviors required for enforcement. So this one is not fixed as variable. So sometimes they will get the They'll get the um the free time after one subject. They might get it after two subjects. They might get it after three subjects. They don't know exactly when it's going to come. So sometimes that is that sustains behavior, right? Um, it's it's steady high response rate, but then um the response rate stays high, then it drops off because it's there's is a level of inconsistency. And children like consistency and they like patterns. They like um predictability in the classroom environment. Then you have the fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. That's a constant amount of time must pass before the reinforcement is available. So if you say you're given a reinforcement every hour, then after, so if the class starts at 8.15, at 9.15, you give reinforcement, 10.15, you give reinforcement, and then after lunch and so on. So after every hour, you give some sort of reinforcement. If it's a variable interval or variable time interval, um, you give it after 15 minutes, you give it after 45 minutes, you give it after hour and a half. Yeah. So it is similar to the variable ratio. The variable ratio is a certain amount of behaviors must be conducted and variable interval is, is any amount of time must pass. The fixed ratio, you have a fixed amount of behaviors. Ratio represents the number of behaviors. It must be fixed. And the fixed interval, that means you get new reinforcement after a fixed particular time. Yeah. So these are schedules of reinforcement. Okay, is that that schedule of reinforcement clear on how they can be used? Any questions? Yes, sir. 
Ya, yeah, ok. Ladies. With you, sir. Mm -hmm. Oshani, Robin. I'm with you. Okay. Right? Okay. Maintenance. The principle of extinction holds that when reinforcement of a previously learned behavior is withdrawn, the behavior fades away. Um, does this mean that teachers must reinforce students' behavior forever? No. Um, so if you gradually increase the number of math problems a student must do to be praised, and then praise students at random intervals, which is a variable ratio, then the student is likely to continue to do math problems for a long time with little or no reinforcement from you. So yeah, the variable ratio schedule will be more beneficial than the fixed ratio schedule if you want to increase the, the volume or the capacity of the student to perform uh, um, under a certain amount of pressure or to increase their capacity for work. So what they're saying is they gradually increase the, the number of math problems that the students must do before they get some so after so if you give them 20 problems and they, they do five you say hey yeah keep going whatever the next time you reinforce you might reinforce them after seven or after eight or after ten you give them the reinforcement so the capacity to do work before they reinforce will grow or expand and you'll get them to do more um work and they'll be more so they'll be able to maintain um a higher volume of work as they progress through school um, the rule of antecedents. Antecedents will be stimuli that act as cues to which behaviors will be reinforced or which behaviors will be punished. Um, discrimination involves using cues to detect the difference between st stimulus situations. So it's important for students to know that not all behaviors are go going to be reinforced. So certain behaviors are going to reinforce and others are not going to be reinforced. And that that ability to discriminate which behaviors that are close that are going to be reinforced and which are not going to be reinforced would be important. Generalization is where the students re move from res respond to similar stimuli um, as if they were responding to original the original stimulus. So for example, in, with Pavlov and his dogs, they had stimulus generalization occurred when they rang a tuning fork, the tuning fork had a song similar to a bell, but it wasn't, it's not a bell, obviously. So, but the dogs began to salivate because the song was similar. But after a while, they began to discriminate. They say, well, okay, the sound of a bell is this, and the sound of the tuning fork is that. And when the bell is presented, they get the food, but when the tuning fork is presented, we didn't get any food. So they move from stimulus generalization to stimulus discrimination. And in a classroom, that can also occur where you're, you're reinforcing certain behaviors and they may do a behavior that is similar and expect a reinforcement and is not reinforced. And when it's not reinforced, you realize, okay, I have to do this specific behavior for the reinforcement. So you have generalization and you have discrimination. Right, so how has social learning theory contributed to understand of human behavior? Um, social learning theory, um, is a major outgrowth of behavioral learning theory tradition. So after behaviorism with Ivan Pavlov and Burasov Skinner, they developed social learning theory because um, Pavlov and Skinner didn't in, include much cognition or much cognitive thought processes in the whole, the whole development of their learning theory. And so it shows this learning theory um, was based on the observation of um, the importance of observational learning and self-regulated learning. Um, Albert Bandura was the main proponent, and he noted that individuals learn through modeling or vicariously observing others through four phases. They paid attention, they retained the behavior that they saw, they reproduced the behavior, and of course they were motivated in one way or the other to repeat the, the particular behavior. So you find that children writing on the board, you teach them to write and they want to write just like Miss or they want to write just like Sir. And they come to you and say, Miss, look, I do it like yours and, and they want, or Sir, look, I do it like yours and they want that reinforcement. So he proposed that students should be taught to have expectations for their own performances and to reinforce themselves. So, they, they, so he's looking at what I spoke about earlier in that independent, developing that independent learner or that um, self-regulated learner. 
So its four elements would include attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. These are the four main elements of Albert Bandura's social learning theory, where individuals are watching and observing and learning from each other. So they have the attentional phase, is where they focus exclusively on what the model is doing to, um, in general, paying attention to models who are attractive, successful, interesting, and popular. So it can be within the classroom, or the classroom, in their family, in the media, and so on. Then the retention fees. Um, so once the teachers have gotten the students' attention, it's time to model the behaviors that they want, and the students um, will try to imitate that behavior and give the students a chance to practice and rehearse. And reproduction fees is during the reproduction phase, the students try to match the behavior to the models. In the classroom, the assessment of the students' learning takes place during this phase when they are tested or when they assess whether formative or um, summative assessment. This is where the reproduction phase is assessed. The motivational phase, the final stage in observational learning is processes motivation. Students will initiate, uh, imitate a model because they believe that in doing so, they will increase their own chances of being successful or being reinforced because they observe the, the benefits that the model would have gotten to their learning vicariously. Uh, Metchenborn's model of self-regulated learning. So we look at observational learning. Now we don't want to talk about self-regulated learning. Um, students can be taught to monitor and regulate their own behavior. Of course, this is developmental in terms of um, depends on their age. The younger they are, the less likely they're able to self-regulate, but you want to introduce it as early as possible in little steps, all right? So he developed a strategy that students can be trained to say to themselves, okay, what is my problem? What is the plan am I going to use to, um, what plan will I have to overcome in this problem? Am I using my plan? How do I um, go about it? So in terms of a diagram, as you can see here on your right, the plan, setting goals, laying out strategies, um, using strategies to monitor the performance, reflect on performance, and, and look at the results, and then you go back into planning. Of course, the more mature the students are, is it easier for them to execute. Um, you, you find that the younger students, um, grades one and two, three, they would struggle with this, but you can, you can still introduce it in small ways to them where you teach them how to plan out an essay, what is included, teach them the steps in analyzing a problem, looking for spelling errors, looking for sent, um, sent mistakes in sentences, developing sentences and so on. Little steps of procedure, you want them to be able to follow. And so you'll be teaching them how to self-regulate. Okay. So they have the strengths and limitations of behavioral learning. Behavioral learning theories are central to the application of educational psychology because it helps in classroom management, it helps in discipline, it helps in motivation, it helps in the use of instructional models. Um, they are limited in scope as they deal mainly with observable behavior uh, that can be directly measured. Um, and they don't focus so much on the cognition, on the cognitive aspects of behavior. All right, it's more on the, the, um, the observable um, tenets of behavior. Okay, any questions based on what we've covered so far? No, sir. Okay, beautiful. Right, so that's end of the first lecture there. Okay, good. So let me just spend a few minutes talking about the tests. Yeah, so in next week we're gonna spend some minutes talking about what the test T E S T <laughs> exam. What is that, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good choice test, Robin. Um, so next week is week four. Week four and week six is supposed to have a test. The last thing. And um the test will be based on. Let me show you what the test will be based on. I'm gonna drop this in the. I'll drop this in the chat. I put it in the WhatsApp group. Yeah, drop it in the WhatsApp group. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, that's not one. One second. So the test is based on the key terms. Where's the group? Where's the group here, yeah, right? I have to make sure I don't I don't put the test in the group and make a mistake and put the test instead of the terms. I know you all wouldn't mind about that, but yeah. Yeah, so the test is based on the key terms for chapters one to four. Um so all you all want to do the test. Now is a it's a multiple choice test. We can do an open book multiple choice. Because of how the um, I have to get a pass with Mr. Seeley, but I can give you an open book multiple choice test. How do you feel about that? Sir, I don't know what you consider being open book. What do you mean by that? I don't know open book, like open book test. No. Whatever method you want to use, it's fine by me. But sir, this um this third semester courses, this third semester, I think your course is very light. But I'm doing a course with this um Jesus and his time and hours, and I'm not getting to breathe. Oh, really? You know? Well, uh -uh, Jesus, say, Jesus said that um my yoke is easy, um, easier, my burden is light. So I don't understand why why, why you're getting so much <laughs> pressure with that course. You should, you should be getting the least amount of pressure with that course. Jesus said, no, come no, no, to me no, only that, that labor, not heavy laden. That, no, the thing, but that rest. course, sir, that course is so packed that oh. when you complete something, you better believe that a couple of comments be coming behind. You don't get into breed. Oh. So okay. like when you talk about a test, I was like, oh, God, a test, all right. I don't try to do your test. So, sir, when is, is your test? Robin, you know, listen to me next week. Next week, oh, Lord. What do you mean? It's only six weeks, you know? Why is only six weeks, sir? I don't know. I don't set the schedule. It's summer. Summer uh, course. Usually six weeks. So cramp, so cramp. Let's pack, pack, pack. Okay, yeah. sir. Yeah, girl. I know. It's a lot. But that's what I was saying. If you want so to So you have an open time and a closing time? What do you mean? Like if you open it, for example, if the letter is Tuesday, like if it's next Tuesday, you open it at five in the morning, close at midnight. Something the like test? that, you're doing it? The test? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. Oh, the test is going. <laughs> I mean, if, <laughs> if the test is going to be open like that, we open for like a two, three hours. It's a multiple choice, 40 multiple choice question. I'm opening that for the whole day. But remember, if you touch the test, you can't go back. Is that a case where you could change? You could go back and oh, change? Oh, right, right, right. That's true, that's true, that's true. Once you complete the test, that's it. Oh, yeah, that's so true. You, start. Yeah, yeah you so to... you could open it for the entire day. Once it touches, yeah, you, you can start. You have, a short, you have a time off. All right, well, I'll have Sorry, to talk to you. Talk... Huh? Sorry, you can put the first 24 hours, like how the, um, the Jesus and times of hours, they normally go for 24 hours. When you give us a point, we do it at a convenient time. Yes, okay, cool. No problem. I'll have to talk to Mr. Silly about that, right? So he will help me with that aspect of it. All right, so you got the, you see the terms? So the test will be based, it'll be for the multiple choice questions based on these terms here. I can't tell you which one come. Anyone could come, right? All right, so let's take a break. And come back in and um let's take a break and come back in and finish in the last lecture. So we take a 12 minute break. You stretch your legs, get something. Gavin. Hi, Miss. Are you making up with Jesus and in, in, Jesus and 
Jesus in his time and hours. <laughs> it was uh -huh. hours. <laughs> by the time you finish it, by the time you finish a test, hey, look, three things coming again. <laughs> That's the point. And like the manga midterm. All the time, look, at all the man the... midterm look at the man midterm test that like you get so much chapters you got to read. Yeah, within a day. But the, I don't understand. He little too bright, man. Oh, Jesus. The man is getting me on my toes all the time. Miss, you but you ever, kept, you ever kept any class that you're aware of? You don't realize the man has recorded himself? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The man don't have to get class like oh, sorry. Yeah, what you find happening is that what I said at the beginning of this first lecture would be replaced by what I'm seeing now. So you have displacement taking place. And of course, again, retrieval, um, encoding and retrieval, um, so that it will go into long-term memory. Now, sometimes, right. So sometimes you might get forgotten. You might forget things in long-term memory through interference or through um, retrieval failure. You might get tip of the tongue syndrome where you, you, you're trying to remember something is right there to be a tongue, but you can't see it, it's it not coming back fully, right? So there, there are some, although long-term memory has a, a unlimited capacity, the issue is how do you retrieve information? The information that you interact most often with, of course, would be the easiest information for you to retrieve. Okay, so let's talk about the sensory register. This is the first component of the memory system. And it deals with information that is coming in. It takes in large amounts of information, but it holds it for a very short period of time, not more than a couple seconds. If nothing happens to the information that is taken in the sensory memory, the information is lost. Okay. Um, perception of sensory and of stimuli and gaining students' attention have important implications for the education. So when you're planning your charts, and you're planning your diagrams, you have to make sure that what you want to be with to capture the student's attention must be in bright color, large enough letters according to the age, or use appropriate pictures and that sort of thing. All right? And again, it is being reinforced here um, of the, the amount of time that infamy, the amount of units you can hold, seven to nine chunks in working memory on infinite capacity in long term. But of course, the period of time it's permanent storage long term and working memory or short term memory is five to 15 minutes, five to 15 seconds. And the duration of sensory memory is 0 0.5 to three seconds. And then it is, then will be forgotten through the key if there's no rehearsal and stuff like that. Working memory, on the other hand, is the storage was five to nine. Um, bits of information. So we say the average is seven. As we said, that the the four numbers are usually seven digits. Information enters working memory, um, both through the sensory register and long term memory. So it can come from both sides. When it's new information, it's coming in from through the sensory memory, and if it is old information, you're retrieving it from the long term memory. Um, re rehearsal, of course, is the process of repeating information in order to hold it in working memory. Long-term memory is part of the, um, the memory system and it has an infinite capacity and you can, information can be stored for an infinite um, time period. Um, the storage is also for learning, can use for learning strategies um, so that you can um, recall information for easy access. Cognitive strategies, learning strategy theories, stress the importance of students being able to relate information being learned to existing information in long-term memory. So it's called a process called elaboration, where you try to help students to link what they are learning to what they already know, what is already established in their long-term memory. Theories divide long-term memory into three parts, the episodic, the semantic, and the procedural. So the episodic memory is like a mental movie where, where you have episodes of your own personal experiences. You might have an episode of going to the doctor, cooking food, going to school, um, going out with friends. Those are all episodes. Then you have semantic memory, which would contain facts and generalized information. 
um, in the form of schema. So you have knowledge of, you know, you know what a car is, you know what a bike is, you know what a tree is, you know what, um, you know what a computer is in a laptop or phone, etc. These are semantic memory. And procedural memory refers to how you do things. How do you ride a bike? How do you cook food? How do you drive a car? You know, procedure. How do you write an essay? How do you research? So those would be the three main types of long-term memory that you would have. Um, again, the semantic stores with facts and generalized information, and most likely it is stored in a, a, a schemata or a network of information. You have higher, it can be structured in a hierarchical way. So you may have um, liquids, and you have different types of liquids in different categories, liquids that you drink, liquids that you don't drink, liquids that you clean with, liquids that you bathe with, liquids, you know, you have a different, all different, a hierarchical category, large liquids, and then it's going to be broken down. So the schema is how, in each individual's mind, how that information is mentally represented. That's the one way of schema theory. So somebody could have a um, schema about sports cars, fast, shiny, expensive, you know, owned by celebrities, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, information fits into well-developed schema. It's easier to learn than information that, that cannot be accommodated. Factors that enhance long-term memory. Um, people do return a, a large portion of what they learn in school, but several factors will contribute to long-term memory. One factor is the degree to which students had learned the material in the first place. So you take the information in, based on the diagram here, you take the information in, um, then it goes to short-term memory, and then it's consolidated or encoded. How do you consolidate that information? Are you putting it, if you put it, write it over in your own words, if you encode it, if you use some diagrams, if you use mnemonic device, if you use some kind of a meaningful learning strategy, then the information will be easily, will be well stored in long-term memory and it will be easy to um, retrieve the information when the time is right. Um, instructional strategies that actively, that actively involve students in the learning contribute to long-term memory. So once the teacher, if the teacher stops and have discussions and dialogue going back and forth, with the students on the different topics and they're involved, you would find that um, that information stays longer than if they're just passively listening and absorbing information. Once they're doing something with the information that involves their own personal input, what we call constructivism or active learning, or they're co-creating learning um, through metacognitive processes, you find that that information will be stored much longer. Other information processing models, you have levels of processing that suggest learners will remember only what they process. So if you have 10 topics and you break up the class into um, three or four persons per topic, you'd find that persons would more or less retain more readily what they went, went what they researched and what they presented rather than what other groups would have presented, what other groups would have researched. Okay, so that personal involvement. Students are processing information when they manipulate it, when they look at it in different perspective and when they analyze it. And that's what we are saying. Then you have the dual code theory, um, suggests the importance of both visual and verbal coding um, to learn bits of information. So at the beginning of this section, because of dual coding, um, I can ask you now, what are the three different types of memory stores? Because we dealt we dealt with dual coding throughout up till now in this group. What are the three different types of stores of memory? Was it was it sensory, long, and short? Uh, sensory. Long and short memory. Long and short in that order. <laughs> well, short and long. Right, century short, right, short term or working memory and right. Okay, so, and what is the, somebody else tell me, what is the capacity for each? Huh? 
how much can be held in sensory, how much can be held in short term, how much can be held in how many items can be held in long term. So it is, so it is short. Norm is a seven to nine. Yeah, that's the yeah, seven to nine items. Mm -hmm. I can't recall it long term. Sorry. Long term is unlimited. Yes, correct. And what is sensory memory? Sensory is unlimited as well, but can only be held in very, very short period of time. It can take in a lot, but it's it decays very, very quickly, right? Okay, so let's get back. So the dual code theory of the information processing model says you, you have visual and global, and that those two codes allow you to store more information than if you have one or the other. What do we know from brain research? Um, we know that specific areas of the brain process specific types of information along with other parts of the brain of different brain sites. As individuals gain more experience, the brain functions more efficiently. So if you look at the brain of an expert and the brain of a novice, when they're processing information, you would find that there's more efficient processing of the information in the expert's brain than in the novice brain. Novice brain is all, a lot of things going all over the place, but the expert is very clinical in which areas of the brain are engaged in the processing because of the amount of experience that the expert has. Um, early brain development involves adding neural um, neural connections. So young children, they, they sprout a lot of connections, a lot of neurons, neurogenesis is very, very prominent early in life. And there are a lot of connections that are made, but there's a lot of pruning taking place or sloughing taking place where those connections and those areas um, that are not used are pruned away, all right? Because the whole notion of, of nature is to develop a more, more efficient brain. So the implications of brain research, uh, many findings have the importance of education and child development in terms of attention, in terms of focus, um, in terms of neural connections, synapses, um, how memory and learning works. All this information is presented in terms of brain research. An important finding of brain research is that a person gains um, knowledge and skills as his or her brain becomes more efficient. All right, one second. Yes, sorry about that interruption there. Yes. Um, another important finding of brain research is that discovery that a person gains um, knowledge and skill, his or her brain becomes more efficient. And that's we're talking about the experts versus the, the novice, right? Um, so there are application, applications of brain research. So applications of brain research to education or in the classroom. Um, not not all learning is equally likely. Some learnings, uh, some types of learning are easier than others. So language and spatial relationships come more easier to young learners than advanced mathematical concepts. And that's because the because of the areas of the brain. So you find that the areas of the brain that responsible for language and spatial reasoning 
develop and mature faster than the areas of the brain that are responsible for advanced mat understanding advanced mathematical concepts like the prefrontal cortex that are responsible for more complex reasoning and logical and, and rationality, right? One can alter a brain, brain that is not ready for incoming um, experience to affect it so that one cannot alter a brain that is not ready for incoming. So readiness in, in learning is very, very important. Brain development constrains cognitive um, outcomes. So you can try as much as you, you want to to teach a more mature child language who have not had the foundation for it and it will be much more difficult than, uh, than the brain that is not developing and not, not forming. All right, some regions of the brain might be particularly important for cognitive outcomes, supporting certain sorts of neural activities related to learning and cognition. And one region of the brain has primary focus of much contemporary research and as a prefrontal cortex, as I just made mention to. Okay. Um, forgetting and remembering. Forgetting can occur um, because information in working memory was never transferred to long-term memory. So there's the decay in the information in working or short-term memory. It has never been coded or transferred. So it's not in long-term memory. So sometimes you do a course and there's a lot of information. You, then, you don't get to consolidate the information. So by the time the course finishes, you lose a lot of what you would have learned. As opposed to a course where you... Um, you involve and integrate in the information and consolidating, consolidating the information and learning information, you find that in that, that, that sort of a process, you learn or you take in more. Okay. Um, it can also occur when you have lost access to information in long-term memory because, it's, again, it's not properly coded. Interference happens when information get mixed up with or pushed aside by other information. And there are different types of information um, interference. So individuals' differences to, to, in resistance to interference may result from differences in the ability to focus on key information um, at a particular time. So forgetting and remembering, you have proactive facilitation. This is where what you have previously learned um, helps you to learn similar information. So learning Spanish can help with Italian because the languages are similar. So that's proactive facilitation. But you have retroactive facilitation is where newly learned information can help with already established knowledge. So learning Latin may help you understand English better. So if you, 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 you're an English speaker and you learn language Latin, which a lot of um, English words have their root in Latin words, you'd find that you would understand English much better. Okay, so those are two processes that would aid in remembering. Um, primacy and recency effects. People tend to remember information at the beginning of the period and at the end of a list or class period. So what you so the primacy effect are the early things that you learn in a learning session, and the recency effects would be the last of the things that you would have learned. And sometimes the majority in the middle um, are lost. The majority of items are lost in the middle. Um, automaticity would be informational skills that exist in long-term memory for such a long time and have been practiced so regularly that they are executed without even any thought, putting any thought into the process, right? So it's it be behavior, certain behavior, and certain things that you learn become automatic. So as teachers, if I ask any of you, any of your seven times, eight times, nine times table, you won't have to write down counters. You won't have to try to calculate it. Those things are... You have dealt with it so many times, they are automatic. They, are, they fall into um, the category of automaticity. Okay, practice. There are certain types of practice exercises that enhance memory and certain types that don't. So distributed practice, where you practice um, a task over a period of time is usually more effective for retention than mass practice, which is like what we call cramming. Right, enactment is the process of learning by doing. Also helps students to, um, to learn information. So if you, it's always better to teach students how to, to practice to internalize a little bit over a period of time because once you repeat certain activities, the pathway in the brain is reinforced and made more clear. So distributed practice over a period of time has a more powerful long-term retention effect than mass cramming. When you cram mass, the, you lose information. It, the information retained for a short period of time, then it is lost. 
Um, and when, as I said before, when students are involved in the activity, you, they tend to um, retain it better, retain information better. There are different ways of teaching memory strategies. Um, so much of the facts that students learn in school can be remembered. Um, and these facts, of course, will form a framework for more complex concepts. Um, factual material can be learned as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, and then you have to leave time and mental energy for meaningful learning. Some learning involves memorization of facts or arbitrary association between terms. So some learning, you just have to learn of this stuff. Some you have to delve into deeper, deeper understanding. So verbal learning, there are three types of um, verbal learning activities that are seen in the classroom. We have peer association, where that involves learning to respond with one member of a peer um, when given other members. So you can learn countries and capitals together um, as, as an example. We have serial learning, which involves a list of terms in a particular order. So you might have Roy G. Biv, so you know, or Soka Tua. So you know where the, the activity the learning of the, the, the sequence is important, okay? And then you have free recall where the individual might just make association between um, different particular systems without any particular order, just free recall. You make, they make some kind of arbitrary connection based on how they think and how they process information. Um, we have verbal learning again, continue. You have the imagery method where individuals will create imagery in their mind to help them to remember the association. Like, like you have sticks, leave on, pen, mine, gun, shoe, tea, hive, gate, and paw. So you might, the person might, um, I might say, you know what? I would put right. So I'll put a gun in the shoe. I will put um a stick in the gate. So you can associate different things with, with each item on the list. So five things. Um they can associate it. And so when they recall one, they recall the other. And you have the local method, which I which would be the use of a mnemonic device for serial learning. So you take all the first letters of each of the word or create a visit of bizarre imagery is used to place the item in the particular location. Um, then you also have the peg word is used, again, it's useful for serial learning in which a student memorizes a list of peg words that rhyme with the number one to 10. And the student then create um, mental imagery because you're using the dual coding process to relate items on one list to be learned with the, with the particular peg words. And of course, the initial letter, the memory strategy that involves reorganizing of the information in which the let, initial letter may be memorized or, or arranged in probably in a word or something that'll be easily memorized. So when you remember the letter, you remember the word that it is associated with. So these are like four methods of verbal learning. What inf makes information meaningful is when we make sense and it has significance for the students. The more meaningful the information is, is the more they, more they can associate and identify with the information is the more meaningful it would be to them. So you have rote learning where the information is just learned um, in a vacuum, so to speak. Meaningful learning is in contrast to le rote learning because it is not arbitrary and the, inf the information is related to what the learner or information or learning that the learner already has. And inner knowledge is knowledge that is applied in a wide range of situations, um, but is applied only to a restricted set of circumstances. Usually, inert information is knowledge that is learned in school, school, but it cannot be applied in real life, like some students might ask, okay, why am I learning quadratic e e equations? Why am I learning this, that, and a lot of concepts in maths, abstract concepts in maths, might be more responsible for the development of the mind rather than pra practical application, and that knowledge becomes more or less inert, right? 
Then you have the schema theory, meaningful information is stored in long-term memory in networks, and we made mention of that before connected facts or concepts called schemata. So if I if I say money or popcorn or um vacation, that would bring up a whole network in your mind that's associated with that word. And through that network is how you would recall is the schema that you have in your mind with, that relates to that particular word or that particular term or that particular concept. Okay. How do metacognitive skills help students learn? So metacognition deals with thinking about thinking and controlling thinking processes and effectively. So as, student, as students mature, they're supposed to begin to understand how best they learn, how they internalize concepts, what strategies best work for them. And that is what the teacher wants to help them to develop in terms of metacognitive strategies. Research on um, study strategies is confusing at best because different students can use different methods that are successful. Effective methods, the most effective methods are those that involve the learners reshaping the information. So they're not passively engaging with the information, but they're actively recreating the information in ways that are meaningful to them. All right? Um, Rereading and highlighting without consciously choosing the most effective information um, to highlight is not as effective. Okay. Some study strategies like practice tests, note taking, self directed, underlining, summarizing, writing to learn as writing over stuff, outlining, mapping. So you're doing something with the information. You have the, pre, the, the PQ4R method, previewing the, the work to be studied, writing questions about it, reading the work to um, answer the questions that you would have written out, reflecting on the material reciting or rehearsing what you're trying to learn and then doing a review accordingly. Um, cognitive teaching strategies held by making learning relevant and by activating prior knowledge. So making learning relevant or activating prior knowledge, this, the teacher can use an advanced organizer to help map out the information that he or she is getting into and so that the students will be able to process new information by recalling on what the background knowledge they have on the topic um, it can also help students to uh, learn the material, orient the students to the, about the material they're about to learn, and they can recall related information that can assist them in incorporating the new information. Other examples of teaching strategies that based on cognitive would be analogies. So you would say, well, okay, this learning, this like information processing is similar to how a computer processes the information processing in the brain is similar to how a computer processes information. So analogy is used so that the, the students now will say, okay, learning this information processing theory is like a computer would take information and store the information, then the information will be retrieved, et cetera, et cetera. Elaboration, as I mentioned earlier, is where um, you try to re help students to relate what they are learning now to what they have previously learned. And that, um, so that the connection is, the connection of the new information is linked to all information, previously learned information, and it helps it to be stored more easy and more easily accessible in long-term memory. Um, information can be organized to be learned in a hierarchical fashion, like we spoke about the categories of stuff, or you can use a questioning technique. So you have your lecture notes and you write questions and you um, from time to time stop to answer these questions and assess whether you're learning. And then you have conceptual models where you would convert the information that you would have um, learned to learn or that you would have studied in the form of diagrams um, so that it can be processed at a later time. All right. Okay, so that's it. I know there's a lot tonight. We covered um, both chapters, but of course, you know, you your responsibility is to read the chapter in detail to get your own information. You all there? Everybody, everybody alive? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Any questions? I remember you could always post your questions in the chat if you have any questions further after the, the lecture and stuff like that. I will try to upload yeah. this one as well as the first one um, on YouTube by tomorrow when I get them organized. And um, I would 
send it, put the links in the in the group chat as well. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. So how we went to the so, yes. what about the research paper? Huh? Or the topic? Yes. The chapter. No, you so can you can choose you can choose, you can choose a, a topic within a chapter to do your research paper. You can do it on behaviorism, you can do it on operant conditioning, you can do it on any of the big topics that we covered, any of the theories that we have covered, you can choose for your topic. Okay. You know, you okay. can do it on a whole chapter. Thank yeah. you, sir. Topic. Huh? Yeah. So come to class next week with your topic. So... I can say, well, yeah, good. Go ahead. Start doing your research. Start gathering information. Do it until last minute. And um, I'll speak to Mr. Seeley in terms of how I'll organize the online test. Open it for an hour. So you'll have access to it and stuff like that. Yeah. But the, the key terms would be what the test would be based on. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. Sandia, Robin. Yes, sir. You yes, good? sir. You all good? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Everything is okay at this end. All right, good. All right. Well, I'm saying good night then. Good night, sir. Have a good, good night. night. All right. All the best until good we. Night. Yep. Next week will be chapter seven and eight.